robots will be so developed that we won't know whether we're speaking with a human or a robot. Technology has progressed, but it hasn't reached the level of being practical yet. But the hope is that it will be practical. Amrit Sanjeev, Senior Developer Advocate at Google. With over a decade of experience in the internet industry, Amrit has established himself as a highly skilled developer with expertise in large systems development, Android OS, mobile applications, Java, Unix, and Linux. Amrit is also one of the founders of BL Android, one of the largest and oldest Android communities in the world. So without getting any delay, I'm welcome Amrit Sanchi on the stage. I know it's late in the evening. This is not going to be a very technical session. I come from a technical background, but I'm not going to talk much about technology today here. Uh, the whole idea is to kind of see where changes will come with the sort of technology, technology coming in, with uh, GPTs, the transformers coming in. You have certain changes in the workspace that comes in. And I want to kind of touch upon some of those aspects. Uh, yeah, basically, I got a lovely introduction, but yeah, I lead the developer relations team. I'm the head of developer relations for Android platform. I primarily focus on Android security, uh, authentication identity, along with some areas like language, localization, uh, and backup and restore, and a few other areas of that. And here, today, I'm not going to speak about Google's perspective. So this is my personal thoughts. So this is not Google's narrative, so don't quote me anywhere with that. So I'm going to be sharing only a personal personal thoughts about what I feel the space will actually evolve in. And again, I am not an authority on the space. So again, some things could, should be taken with a pinch of salt. I'm sharing my perspectives here. And I am not going to do any doomsday predictions. Okay, we had, uh, we can go this way, but I'd like to stick to being a little bit on the cautiously optimistic side of things. Because yes, many speakers before me told me about, about, told us about the changes that will come and how it might negatively impact our work. I feel it's just an evolution of work. Uh, and there will be impact, that's for sure. There is no, there's no denial of that, but I don't want to talk about this extreme of it. So this is not what I want to touch upon. I want to kind of talk more at a place where this is converging together, how we can actually work together with these systems and see where, uh, how things will change for us. Most of the narrative, and this is a very interesting narrative to talk about, it catches the eye all the time. So people always compare, it's about egg machines against us. Uh, that's like saying the car against the driver. Uh, if you want to think about it that way, yes, the machines are always against us. Cars cause accidents. If you were walking, you might not get into a 40 mile, ac 40 mile an hour accident. Yes, that's true. But it also brings in advantages, right? So I want to kind of touch upon the world, not that this doesn't exist. So I'm not into that. Uh, I'm not trying to give a perspective that everything is uh, a bed of roses or anything. This does exist at certain points. If you can, you can take this narrative if you want. But I want to kind of touch upon today a space where we are working together. So if you look at search, for example, and that's where I want to start with, uh, and maybe a few examples of what I've tried in generative AI space. Uh, search, for example, was basically you were getting a bunch of data. You were asking for some data. You put in a search query, you get a bunch of websites or links that you can go and look at data. Now from that, you form information. And so you apply a layer of layer, which is basically the transformer, which is your brain today, which is actually converting all that data into some information, and then you kind of use it at your work. Then over a period of time, you get some experiential data along with that. So again, your brain works as another layer and creates wisdom out of that. A lot of times, people actually with a lot of experience, a lot of deep knowledge at a certain spaces is able to kind of create that wisdom layer of information and then share with people. The last layer, let's leave. What these generative AIs will, is basically doing today is that they are actually giving you the information straight off. They're generating that data and then sharing their information with you. This means the way we'll actually, it's not, doesn't mean that you go and jump in and use that thing. 
you need the skills to verify because today how most of us are trained over the years with just search is we integrate this verification mechanism throughout building the intelligence so as you go from the data to intelligence you're verifying all the time at short intervals in short loops and that's how you get to a decent intelligent outcome it could be right or wrong but yes that's what you generate out of it whereas here you're getting the output first and then you got to verify so a lot of times that verification step becomes important it's not going to take developers work out but your developer will be verifying a lot of code more than actually writing about it i'll give you my example the other day i was actually writing a class i, I wrote a test class which basically was about some image manipulation code five functions took me about 15 minutes to write i was kind of okay with it i gave it to one of the generative things uh, we have an internal system for it uh, bard at google and then there's also chat gpt so i gave it to a couple of these asked it to optimize it wrote an optimal code for me from what i written it rewrote some parts of it i asked it why did you write it this way it explained beautifully why that happened the next step i was i did was okay write me the java code for this it wrote beautiful comments for all the classes in java doc format then i said write all the unit test cases for this it wrote the unit test case for me this is something that would have taken me another 20 minutes or third, an hour to do and it was goddamn boring to write comments on a class that you've just written this is sort of automation that you should be using to kind of make things a lot faster this is the evolution earlier somebody would be sitting and typing in which means you ask somebody to do a piece of work they are going to give you an estimate which is like say x days now that x days is slashed to maybe one day because these systems can help you do it yes you still have to verify every single bit of output that is there so that things are legit it can get things wrong i have seen optimization of code optimized code generating different outcomes so it is not optimized correctly the outcome was incorrect sometimes it misinterprets your intention of a function it writes wrong comments for it so that does happen at least in my case it was roughly less than 2% uh, which was something i can bear with because with my with a human verifying it i think 2% is good enough error rate where i can catch it with this much of savings of time before that so that's where we need to kind of think about it this is all about evolving how we work than it just completely removing us from the equation. So for immediate perceivable impact, one is you're going to get a new paradigm of how you interact with a computer. Earlier, you are going to put in a few, few words, you're going to get a set of links, you're going to convert, you're going to read many of that, we take pieces of information together, switch it up in your head, and you create some information out of that, from that data. Here, you are going to change away from that sort of explicit commands to kind of ask things. Okay, I want all the files that was actually edited in the last 48 hours on this machine in this folder. Today, you need to know a set of commands to do that. Tomorrow, you can just talk to it. And that will happen, which means that the, the ability to do certain tasks and the, the, what is it, the entry barrier certainly comes down. This is positive. A person can, who does not know how to type, does not have literacy, can talk to the computer. And these models can understand different languages. It doesn't need to be English only. There are languages, I mean, we've, we've trained out in Spanish and other languages. I've seen models which work on that beautifully well. So you can actually, imagine you're coming to a kiosk and you don't know how to type. You can just talk to it and it actually does the work for you. So these sort of enhancements also comes around. It mimics human to human interaction, which makes it a lot more confident. Yes, there is a catch here. If it's doing the wrong thing, you're going to trust it for doing the wrong thing. So that's why you've got to be a little careful about it, but it does mimic human interaction and it makes it very personalized. It's intuitive and it becomes very, very personalized. If you actually tell, if you take a history of any of these chat generative systems, you can actually start typing the next sentence with the context of the first sentence or the whole, whole chat. You can say that, oh, I want the best ticket to go to Delhi. From there, I want to go to Nagpur. What is the best mode of transport? Imagine I'm taking road. What are the best eateries in the place? If I'm eating at this place, where should I take the next? This is how we communicate to a person. This is how you can actually communicate to the, to the machine also. And it will actually respond really quickly. Imagine typing all this. It's going to take so much more time than just... If you just had to type it on your keyboard, on your phones, which are small cramped keyboards, it's going to take so much time. So that's another place where Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa, and all are slightly bringing that to your doorstep today where it could be a lot more intuitive and a lot more useful with these sort of models. In. Next one is where are business opportunities coming in? So you have these large 
really large models. So these are areas in which there will be new work that will be generated. There will be research in creating these models. One of the biggest things that most, I mean, we have not touched yet is the reason why some of these things are not mainstream today is because it's exorbitantly expensive to run. They are not tuned to run at commercial space because it's just expensive in terms of energy, in terms of compute power, in terms of how much heat it generates. Is this crazy amount of compute that's needed for to do all this? That's why ChatGPT is not, or any of the system like that, which is already out there in the market, is not integrating into a search today. Not because the technology is not there. It's just as exorbitantly expensive to run that operation like that. So that is one aspect. So you can actually give these models, make them more efficient, create hardware that will actually make it more efficient, create transformers is a five-year-old technology. The paper was in 2017. And from then to now, people are not just working on applications. There's a set of people who are in research who wrote the first Transformers system. Right? They are actually evolving it further with these constraints in mind. So there will be new things that will come which will improve the capability. That will bring it down to devices. You can't run a transform. I mean, like you, you might be able to run it on a mobile hardware reader. So there are multiple constraints on which research is happening. So that's an area of space. You can offer this as a service, these models as a service. But another vertical where it will be really, really useful for many companies to kind of check in is uh, if you take the analogy of mobile, for example, Google and Apple created major OSs that got in the market. And we still continue to build those OSs and platforms. But there's a lot of companies that sprung up and created apps on these platforms and made a lot of money. So basically, for all these verticals, these models need to be tuned to specific problems. That's not going to be done by the people who are building these models. They're going to be done by external people. That is an opportunity that somebody could actually jump into right now. You could create a model that works really well for medical space. You could work, make something that's really good for, uh, say, image processing. There were some examples that were shown earlier about video generation, uh, <coughs> voice, chain, voice cloning, things like that, right? Now, there will be multiple use cases like that which you can use and build solutions and make money out of that. And uh, there's also capability integrating these into products your existing products working better because you have these capabilities around it. Simple thing, FedNeo, if you look at, that is actually Federal Bank having a chatbot which runs something similar to a generative AI model where you can talk to it. The chatbot doesn't just like, good morning, what is my balance, this is your balance. It doesn't work like that. It actually is like a conversation. You should try that system. It's actually developed by a company in Cochin and Federal Bank uses that and it's getting integrated to multiple banks right now because that's just what people want. You should be able to talk to it on what and multiple, it's an omni-channel system. You can talk to it in WhatsApp or you can continue the chat on a browser or you can take it to your phone and continue. So those sort of opportunities do come along with these sort of changes. And providing a lot of tailored experiences. That is really important. Today you see that glimpse of it in your product search pages. You get your right products together or these are the products you like and it comes on your home page first. What about that experience being really, really smart? It takes a lot more data, understands you, and just predicts your need and then starts showing things to you. Search time reduces your ability to kind of, or your purchase increases. You can use it for multiple things. Uh, again, productivity. This is a space where developers definitely today can actually play with this. Like writing unit test cases, I know as a developer myself, uh, I write code, a lot of developers don't like this. And most of the time, developers don't write unit test cases. They say, oh, the project has very little time for us to do that. Again, it's also kind of a boring task. It's not as challenging as writing the code itself. You can actually, today you can actually get these systems to write it for you completely documented to the T and there is nothing else that you want to do. Just check, verify, check it in. So the one code review is the gap between you and checking get code in. Uh, and you can run those test cases immediately. So there are spaces where you can actually really improve. Uh, you can do things like predictive maintenance. Uh, a lot of cars actually have some small models like this, but it's not generative AI, I'm talking about general AI, but you have machines, you have IoT systems where you can actually predict where the maintenance would come and then you can actually start looking for signals which will actually enable you to do this and you can learn continuously. It's a loopback system, it's a feedback system, right? So it can actually learn, react to your environment. So you deploy the model, it will actually keep learning your environment and start predicting things accordingly for you. So there are multiple places in which you can really start freeing up people's time to kind of do higher value tasks. Instead of your trained electrical engineer going in and looking at the reading of each sensor, what if the system told him exactly what sensor needs to be replaced and what is the life of the sensor predicting it correctly? 
you're saving time to do higher value tasks. Maybe design a better network. So that's the evolution that will happen. So some of those day-to-day -day tasks will definitely actually go ahead and change, but it will definitely help you also do a lot of decision making better. It's going to give you insights. Uh, a lot of that can be things that you can use for good. Again, scientific progress. This is an area of research that I'm talking about. So may basically large data, usually research works with really large sets of data and there's a lot of time required to analyze and come up with, with positive and negative parts of it and have multiple theories we created, simulated. A lot of times simulations are what, I mean, I've been a researcher myself, so I know simulation, writing simulations itself is a really tedious task and then running simulations are usually not very, it takes quite a lot of time. So if you find a mistake in your simulator, it means really a lot of time lost. Uh, so those sort of things can be definitely used to help people speed up, speed up the technology moving further. So if you are able to run your tests, whatever it is like, it's not clean. I mean, there will be definitely, like if you take medicine, for example, the human trials will take the same amount of time. But the data coming back and the iteration of that data to actionable information could be like shortened out to a really small time. So there are points in which you can really actually change the length of time in which maybe new drugs are actually released or how information is spread to people. These are all the bright sides of things that I'm talking about. That it could be used to spread wrong information also. I'm not going down there. But still, when a workforce from a workforce perspective, right, workers will definitely need to kind of bring up new skills. They will have to work with these tools. One, have the capability to build. If you're a developer, you need to understand how these things work so that you can integrate that. You can come up with new use cases. You can come up with new experiences for, if it's a product, you want to bring that experience to users, right? So you really want to kind of be able to skill, to be skilling yourself up to analyze and understand these systems. And one thing about this is that you can't read one paper and understand this. This is a space which requires a good amount of technical understanding. Uh, as far as I've seen it, at least my journey has, on it has been like that, uh, that there is a certain amount, you can't be like, start your AI journey on a Friday and be using that on a Monday very effectively and efficiently. If you're building something new, yes, you need to understand what these technologies are. Yes, there are libraries and new tech, new, new advancements coming there, which makes developers life easy. But today there is a certain amount of entry barrier to it. So scaling up is something that definitely workers will have to do. And which means companies providing that incentive to scale up, companies helping developers scale up correctly, finding the right stuff for it, giving the time for it, not dismissing that as something or not needed for us sort of attitude. So that's, that's all going to be there. Uh, collaborating with our AI systems, well, definitely you will have to integrate with many of these things. They don't operate like conventional code and their outcomes can be different. So you really need to understand how you can integrate them. Uh, like how many, most of you guys, uh, many of you might be using apps today. How many of these apps are integrated with either Siri or uh, a Google Assistant? There are APIs to do that, but why people are not doing it is because they haven't really explored those use cases and they haven't seen that. So here, yes, this integration points will actually start coming up to be more, more important and more relevant where people will demand that sort of an experience. Today, if you say chat GPT, if we are all talking about that, a GPT model, right? We have a chat GPT or BART. Everybody wants it to be integrated to search today. Everybody wants that experience now, right? Because they've experienced it once. So they know that yeah, that's an experience that they want now. Now, imagine you're a product company where the, your competitor has actually integrated this experience and you're behind and your team is not capable of or is not skilled enough I was not exposed to the skills needed to kind of do this. Whose fault is it? It's not the team's fault. It's your fault not seeing that future in front. So it's, it's about seeing some of these spaces uh, and understanding what needs to be done. Continuous learning. I think this is something that we always talk about. I think uh, the first speaker also mentioned uh, about it. Uh, Sunny also mentioned about it. Uh, but what I, what I mean here is this is not optional anymore. Uh, there are spaces that Jiku was talking in the break about spaces of people where they don't really learn a lot of new tech, but that's not going to be optional anymore. There will be continuous learning because things will evolve really fast. What you're using today is not going to be the set of things that are there tomorrow. We're talking about all these generative AI tools today because it's nice buzzword, but these are five, five or six year old systems. They are not designed yesterday. Like I said, Transformers, the technology which was released five years back, the papers are five years back. They 
used it, perfected it, or kind of evolved it to kind of come up with a good product. Came up with one great use case. There could be hundreds of use cases like that that are coming out. Now there's a wave, so a lot of products will come, and you will also need to kind of catch up with that time. So Kanye's view is definitely going to be there. Uh, focus on creativity and innovation. This is going to be very important because a part of the workforce is really just doing that minimum thing that they need to do, which is repetitive tasks, which have very little value but takes time. They continue to do that. Yes, they might not make a lot of progress, a lot of money and uh, salary and all that, but still they continue to survive. With these sort of systems coming in place, those jobs are going to go away. Data entry, very difficult. Answering questions on a chat or, or via voice. In 2018, we actually displayed something. Google actually in I.O. displayed something called Duplay, which is a two-way conversational AI, where you can talk to it, give it a task, and it will actually do the task for you. We, we, I mean, if you have not seen that, check out 2000 Duplay demo in 2018 I.O., where it actually books a restaurant, booking, and it spoke like a person to the other person. If you see it, it, it really, you cannot differentiate whether it's actually an assistant of a person calling or is it like a computer generating it. You just cannot make out the difference. It was that good in 18. Imagine how much it would be by now. Because these things evolve, like the hockey stick that uh, Jiku was mentioning. This hockey stick is going to just keep going. It's not going to wait for you to catch up. So that's where uh, you want to be developing new products and services, which actually is exploring business models capable of integrating these things together. Flexibility. Your jobs will change very often. Like say, I started working close to about 20 years back. And uh, at that time, it was like maybe a five to six years is when a technology revolution came and it changed. The mobile was the first thing about eight years into my career, which had done, made a big change. Then it just kept tumbling. Every now and then there's new things coming in. You got to relearn it all over again. If you take Android, for instance, okay, your native development, then Flutter came in, then Kotlin came in, then Compose came in, and just coming a shorter and shorter interviews for intervals for you to catch up. So evolving your jobs to adapt to some of these things. Some of these, some of your programmers will always already be actually doing a little bit of data analysis already. If you're a backend developer, sometimes you would be doing a little bit of data analysis. So that whole point of he's a data analyst, I am the backend coder, I am the front end developer, I am the designer, that will blur because there's gonna be a lot of tools that will come which will help you move. Somebody's talking about it. If I'm just making something in Figma, why can't you generate all the code for me from that? Why should I actually not do that? I mean, do it automatically by myself. I mean, or why should I employ a developer to do it? Let it be automatic from there, right? These sort of systems are already there. So what happens, it blurs the difference between the designer. Now you can tell a system, hey, I want an interface which has three buttons, looks material and flat, uh, and follows this material or flat theme, and uses these colors for this particular use case and it will generate that UI for you. And you say, I want it in this sort of format, it will write it in that format. So you can actually train models to do all these things really easily. And if this is not future, this is today or yesterday. Future is going to be even more complicated use cases. Uh, so the, the, that's the urgency at which we need to evolve and adapt. So from a company's perspective, and I think I'm going to keep time here. So uh, from a company's perspective, uh, you will have to recruit AI talent. Uh, you will have to make it important that you have that sort of an arsenal in your belt because when the competition or your users demand, you will need to be able to evolve your products to that point. This is not going to be optional. Many times you, the, the experience of something which is integrating one of these systems, like you are using a lot of this in your day-to-day -day already. Google Maps, AI-powered tool, your phone's battery management, both iPhone and Android, is AI powered, it's an adaptive management system. Uh, how uh, your screen is managed, uh, automatic brightness detection, all these are small, small models which learn with time. Uh, there are umpteen models that are there on the phone, uh, there's at least your call. Android has a feature where it will actually generate the packets that you're missing while you're having a conversation. Because see, if you're actually having a voice conversation, you can get breakages, right, where you miss voice. Android has a system that fills it by figuring out the first and second packet and says, oh, this is what it should be in the middle and fills it for you, giving you a really clear conversation, end to end, even in a bad network. It actually removes all the background noise. You guys are all chatting here, humming, I mean, that'll create a hum if everybody chats here at the same time. 
I can take a phone call and my listener is not going to hear anything other than my voice. Already running on your devices for many years. Uh, so these sort of systems are already there. It's just that we, we sometimes have missed it or not taken it. So we need those sort of talents. So companies need to invest in hiring AI talent and also bringing in an AI friendly culture. If you have an employee base right now and if you're not investing in helping them understand, it doesn't mean that you have to give like one day off for you to study AI. No, that's not my intent. It doesn't work in that way. But you've got to make it important for them to understand that, hey, this is a space that we should have an understanding of. It is good for you to evolve and understand the space. Because when it's not going to be like when the demand is there, you're going to be able to learn and do it in time. You need to be able to skill up the right way. So that's where one of the things would be uh, important for a company. The other way is integrate into your operations. Like I said, code, unit testing. Most of your companies would be doing it. Why don't you use one of these generative systems to create it for you and get somebody to verify? It's going to cut down your development cost by um, a really, really short period of time. Most companies were doing it all by the book. Not everybody does it and not for every project, nobody does it. So uh, you might be writing your, uh, you might be documenting things. You might be uh, writing, uh, what do you say, <coughs> Uh, code comments, you might be writing test cases, you might be sitting and having an optimization run of your code. All these things are done in companies which actually extends the li length of a project, right? So something that I experienced, something that could have taken me three or four hours of work was done in like less than three or four minutes. And imagine in a project of a year long, five people working, how much time it's going to save. Most of you folks who are project managers or HRs will be able to really calculate that in terms of money. It's really easy to convince somebody to kind of do this. And it's not like you can't do it today. You can do it today. And the capability is already there. It's, and in the next set of, I feel, in the next couple of months, you will have tools which will integrate into your studio or IntelliJ or whatever virtual studio, which will allow you to automatically do this. Select a source, right click, optimize. Sends you the optimized code. Replace or review, whatever. Buttons come. Comes in automatically. Okay, write the test cases for this. Compare the test case against my previous code and current optimized code. What, what is the performance difference? Why is it optimized this way? All this is possible today. Internally, I've written a plugin for Studio which can do all these things automatically. Uh, it can't be released out, but it, internally, just a proof of concept, it's there, it's possible. We have uh, a system called BARD, which only I have access to it. So that thing can do the same sort of work. It's also a generative AI, I mean, generative model, <coughs> transfer model. So. It does the same similar things. You can do it with uh, OpenAI APIs today. Uh, or, or any other APIs, that, I mean, whichever model suits you better, you could actually go ahead and build these tools. Uh, it's possible today. So getting it into your operations, automating many of these things, repeating, I mean, reducing this repetition of tasks, these are places where you're going to save a ton of money, literally a ton of money. And you can redeploy all these resources to something more valuable. Calendar booking. Have you seen Google Calendar? It automatically, if you say, I want to kind of get 15 minutes of focus time, uh, not close to a meeting, and it can actually figure out a space in your calendar and find it for you. This is something a person actually, the assistant admin actually does it for you. If you have an admin, the admin actually does it for you. Can you block a time on Monday? The admin will go look at a calendar and say, oh, this time is there, but this time we have to go somewhere, so this is in private. All this is an AI can do it in no time. I can do it today. So that's where you want to kind of redeploy that resource to something more useful. Writing. You want to write your OKRs, I mean, or, or what your objectives, whatever you call it in your companies. Ask one of these systems and it will write you beautiful objectives. And you just give it keywords. I wrote it as a test for my team. I wrote it as a test case and I showed it to my team and they didn't understand. They didn't see that. They didn't recognize it was written by AI. They said, okay, these are good. Have we missed this point? Okay, one or two points I did miss. That's the only comment that they had. Two-page document written in about 30, 40 seconds for me to edit for the next 15 minutes. My work is done. Me writing two pages one day. Because I have to keep all this in mind, right? What is a one-year vision? What my team is capable of? All that thing I have to keep in mind. But when you say that the system is writing for you, it does it beautifully well. So this gives you a head start in a lot of these sort of work items. So that's where you have to integrate into operations. Uh, then again, developing products that will be driven with AI or services which are actually going to be where you can sell a service, AI service to somebody. So it's like you have cloud as a service or which you have an AI module as a service. Somebody can actually rent it and then work with you on that. 
And this is a space where, yes, companies will have to invest. It, you can't leave it to the large companies only. Uh, a lot of these do not have the same ethical uh, definitions that we have. We have to ensure and invest in making this being used responsibly. A lot of these things, we had examples that you already told about, can be used incorrectly. Can be used for harming somebody. Yeah, you could say, how can I remove this person from, I mean, how can I get this person's followers on Instagram? How can I cyber bully this person? It will give you some answers if it is an unfiltered system. Today's systems won't do that, but because they're, they're controlled by you, controlled by certain laws, which are these ethical laws that we put in. But you could actually create something like that. So there should be some place where these ethics are actually codified and then put it into it and you see that your systems are responsible in nature. So that's another place where investment needs to be actually put in. You will not be able to do this alone. Just don't have enough data. A lot of people don't have enough data to do this. When I said a lot of companies are going to work on the second layer of what optimizing this for a vertical rather than actually really, really pushing the boundary for this uh, where you're going to create large LLMs, where which is like really large models, language models. And when, if you're talking about GPT, whereas image processing and image video, there's always generation. Uh, there are more and more generative tools that are, could be there. And generation is just one part of AI. There are other fields on AI that, you really get, that could also be explored. Today, yes, generative AI is really cool. It looks nice, but areas to work, definitely hardware improvement. Uh, many of you might not be working on hardware, but still, that's, an, that's a key area. A lot of this is possible because we have TPUs right now. TPUs were not hardware that we had like many years back. We couldn't run it efficiently. Still, it's too expensive to run this right now. So we will be looking at models which are actually smaller, faster, more efficient. So those are all areas of research that can actually be done by any team. Or optimizing it for a vertical, that's, that's definitely going to be a space where there's be killer applications coming out and companies really making a big Big amount of money in that. So, yeah, so working together, collaborating with other AI startups, understanding and learning, because like, uh, like this conference, uh, you will have to learn from each other for sure. I mean, I've been a big community guy for many years. Uh, like in my introduction, I mentioned about BL Android. That was the first Android community started in the country. We still have about 13 or 15,000 members in that. Uh, and we regularly run events, and it's been running for like 13 years or something now, 13 or 14 years now. Uh, and uh, so from a community perspective, I understand that I've learned a lot more from the community than I've learned myself alone. And when you have trouble or when you want to kind of, when, I mean, if you look at my profile, you look at go Stack Overflow and see, I've not asked many questions on Stack Overflow. The reason is not because I don't have questions to ask, it's because I know the guy who's an expert at that or, or somebody else uh, who's, who's in my vicinity, who's a phone call away because they are in the community that I actually have worked in. And they're not in my company, they could be in another company, but we all help each other. And that's how we learn. So working with other startups, working, exchanging ideas, those things are all really, really important. Even though it looks like you're exchanging secret sauce, no. Uh, most probably your ideas, you're the only one vested in your ideas so much that you will put all the effort behind it. Uh, you just need to learn from each other. So that's another point that definitely people should be investing time into. I see that not happening much. Partnerships and collaborations happening not enough. Enough of that, I don't know. There could be many opportunities here. You should just open your eyes for that and see. And there could be something that uh, could become a better business for both, the, both sides. And uh, lastly, you need to keep investing in governance policies. You really need to kind of do that part of it. AI is uncontrolled, is dangerous. It can lead to... It's not going to stop learning one thing. So you say, oh, it's as smart as me today. It's so good. Tomorrow morning, it's smarter. The next second is going to be even smarter. So you really need governance policies and how people will use this. You also need to have ensure that access is not limited to only the, like assume that there's an amazing system which will generate code for everybody, but it's only accessible by the company who built it. Nobody else will actually be able to touch that. But it needs all the code in the world. Access should not be limited like that. Uh, certain things where it's ge general intelligence which is or general data that's taken and made, I think access should be provided to a lot more people, not restricted to just a few, which will tip the power really differently. Data is a new oil, we all hear that all the time, right? So if you actually have information that's only going to be available only for a few set of people, uh, and that access cannot be, you can't take that access and even verify it, becomes really difficult. So that governance and uh, 
access control is really required and ways to control and manage bias see this is like a person it will have bias based on the data it's given one thing that everybody needs to understand even a generative ai it is not creating any revolutionary new thoughts it's showing you information in different ways from what you have fed it if you don't feed it anything it cannot tell you anything if you feed it garbage it is going to give you back garbage it's not going to be like no it's like a person you take the conditions in a certain way bias it by giving them completely a polarized view of the world that person's out, output about a certain situation will be that polarized same way it will happen for this so controlling and managing bias is something that's there it's just not controlling it's also uh, the fact that you need to understand bias and that that's that's actually going to be a really tricky problem to solve many companies invest a lot into doing this and this is really really important to do that if you're building systems like this and lastly verification processes how do you verify all this data that's going to be thrown out it says i have experience where i've asked you to write some code it told me use a certain function and then do it i it was in compose for android and i was like oh shit i knew compose well but i never knew about this function how did i miss this and i went and looked back at the code base we don't have that function this guy just made up a function and told me just use it and so those sort of things do happen there are mistakes that will come so you need to have verification processes for this it's not going to always spit out information don't give it any more weightage than you would give to somebody telling you a uh, perception about or perspective about something so that verification processes have to be like really 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 refined and defined not just for people using it when you're building it into products also is this actually going negative there was an instance of uh, i don't know if it's a generative ai but microsoft had something on twitter and a day it started being very racist negative ask people to go kill themselves uttered words it shouldn't just because it learned from the people that talked to it people were people were racist to it it started throwing out racial slurs so these things can happen so you need control mechanism and they had to shut it down at the end of 24 hours because it was giving so much of bad press so there are things like that that can happen even with your product somebody could train it incorrectly uh, somebody could make it do malicious things so that's something that you want to be careful about so that's also another area that you need to invest i think that's all from me that was my last year. yes that was all all the things that i had uh i know i didn't uh i was quick there were 27 slides in 20 minutes so i had to be fast uh, but there is any questions or any discussion that you want to have i'll be around and hopefully this was useful information i was trying to say it slightly different perspective to the other speaker so hopefully it gives you a more wider thought process to work with thank you